Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today I'll briefly discuss Robert Frost and read a few of his poems. In addition to what your textbook has to say and what you find online, and there is a wealth of material on Frost, just consider his rural aspects, how so many of his poems are set outside, outdoors, in the country, ranching, farming world. He'll take a material aspect, a, an activity, such as picking apples or mending a wall, and enlarge that into a cosmic, significant, spiritual insight. I'd like to start by reading Mending Wall to you, so if you please open your book to Mending Wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I've come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. And on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again, we keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He's all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, Good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put an ocean in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in and walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only, and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. Isn't that a beautiful poem? Um, Frost understood as well or better than most poets the sound aspect. He was beautiful um, with creating smooth, mellifluous sounding poetry that reads like prose, doesn't it? It uh, is connected with subjects and verbs and objects, and most of the sentences are complete. A few things to consider. Um, something there is. Notice the inversion of the words, not there is something. Something there is. That's poetic, isn't it? And it, it asks the question, what is it? that doesn't love a wall? Is it something in nature? Is a wall natural? It begs the question. So what does the wall symbolize? The narrator of the poem wants to know why there's a wall and thinks that the neighbor who says good fences make good neighbors is really an old stone savage. Now what does that seem to imply? And why is the wall being mended? Why did Frost not use the word repair or fix? Very curious. I just asked these questions and tossed them out to you, and, and uh, you think about them and come up with your ideas. Let's have a look at after apple picking now, please. 
my long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap, as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. As with most of his poetry, Frost is beautifully symbolic in such a rural, simple way. He'll take the average activity of a farmer or a rancher, in this case a harvester, a picker of apples, and make it an analogy, an allegory of life. The material act of picking an apple in the hands of a great poet Frost is transformed into a spiritual insight of some sort. Look at all the potential symbols in here, starting, of course, with the apple. You can play around with your uh, knowledge of the biblical symbolism of an, of an apple, or perhaps the apple is just what exactly? He's picked so many of them. He says 10,000, thousand of them. And he climbs a ladder to get them. And there's sleep in this poem as well. Um, the sleep of death, perhaps. His life is near an end. He has harvested so much, he's tired of it now. Um, again, as in with the other Frost poems, and most of the poetry we're looking at in this class, I'm not going to give you any definitive answers, because... Perhaps there are none. And anyway, I much prefer that you play around with them and tease the meaning of, out of these poems for yourself. Much more pleasurable that way. Let's continue with another classic, one of the most widely anthologized poems by anyone, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry... I could not travel both, and be one traveler. Long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Wow. The simplicity of that poem uh, belies the profundity. For we're all faced with these choices, aren't we? 
Sometimes it's an either-or choice in this case. Uh, do I stay in Tampa or do I move to Atlanta? Do I marry her or break up with her? Do I take this job or stay at my present job? And these decisions, these roads, lead on to other roads. Way leads on to way. Such that one choice to go one direction as opposed to another will change everything. It's a fascinating and profoundly true aspect of our existences. Well, in this case, Frost decided, or at least the persona of this poem decided, to take the road less traveled by, and that made all the difference. So perhaps he's talking about the road that he took to be a poet. But regardless, could apply to many other things, couldn't it? It's a poem that is definitive, isn't it? Definitive. There's really no other statement that you could make uh, conceivably that could exceed the simple profundity of this statement. For this topic, this subject, he said it as clearly, succinctly, and symbolically as you might imagine it could possibly be said. Let's do out out now. I call your attention first to the footnote to enlighten you that this came from a passage from Shakespeare's great play, Macbeth. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. Poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's uh, the context. Uh, great passage. <laughs> Macbeth is uh, in the throes of absolute uh, insanity, realizing that uh, what he has done in murdering the king has affected his life forever. At any rate, out, out, brief candle. I it's gone. It's curious to see the relationship between that contextualized passage and this poem, which on first glance, might not seem to have much to do with it other than the out, out. Life is just a candle. Boom, it's gone. Let's read it. The buzz saw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove-length sticks of wood, sweet-scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. And from there, those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges, one behind the other under the sunset far into Vermont. And the saw snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load. And nothing happened. Day was all but done. Call it a day. I wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper. At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting. But the hand! The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half an appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all. Since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart, he saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut off my hand. The doctor, when he comes, don't let him, sister. So. But the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath. And then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, 
since they were not the one dead, turn to their affairs. Whew, that's a chilling poem, isn't it? Notice uh, the S sounds in there. S. Like a snake, the saw, the buzz saw, snarled and rattled and made dust and drop stove links, sticks, sweet scented stuff, supper. The saw knew what supper meant. S hiss. Death just comes right on you. Sudden, accidental death. You know, it's your fate, it's your time. The fragility of life. And then the cold, harsh reality at the end of the poem. I mean, this is classic New England stoicism. Since they were not the one dead, they turned to their affairs. Wow. Uh, let's mourn a little, maybe, huh? Well, they mourn in their own way. But life goes on for the living. The dead are dead, and it's a harsh, cold reality, the world out there, and there's more wood to be cut. Let's take a look at the little masterpiece, Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. <laughs> boy, oh boy. <laughs> That's a chiller, isn't it? That's such a wonderful dichotomy here. Fire, ice. Interesting. Notice how he sets up desire with fire and the supposed opposite, which is ice, is hate. So that sets up an opposition of not love and hate, but desire and hate. And desire is more usually equated with lust, is it not? Kind of an eros sort of love rather than an agape love, if you were. Very curious. Very curious. I'm wondering, in fact, if that is intentional on Frost's part or was just convenient because it rhymed. <laughs> you know? Sometimes you wonder about those things, or at least I do. But at any rate... Uh, Fire will destroy you. Ice will destroy you. They both suffice. Uh, I suppose thus then it's a, a testament to um, moderation. Huh? Don't go overboard in either direction or that will lead to your demise. Just a couple more. Uh, let's do stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Boy, I just, I just adore this poem. This has got to be one of my five favorite poems by anybody, anytime, anywhere. <laughs> and, that and that includes everyone. I guess that's what I meant by anybody. Uh, look at all the symbols here, the woods, the village, the snow, the horse, the lake, the darkest evening of the year, the harness bells, the shaking, the sound, the wind, the flake. How can the woods be lovely, dark, and deep? Uh, lovely is dark, dark is lovely, lovely is deep, deep is dark, deep is lovely. The play of just those three adjectives are curious. And what the heck is he doing out there? Where is he going? Who is he? How does he know this person whose house is in the village? There's almost like a paranoia here, isn't there? He will not see me stopping here. Why is he stopping here? Is this just a rest, a, a respite, briefly, between here and there? And what are the woods and the frozen lake? He's right in between these things. The woods, the mystery, the unknown, the frozen lake. Lake, a symbol of frozen ice, the unconscious, what he doesn't know. And what promises are these that he has to keep? 
And why does he repeat that? The couplet there at the end, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. It's just so beautiful. Do you think he ran out of things to say? No, that would be discounting his genius. Um, it acts as some sort of refrain, a refrain like a bell, like a, like something he's telling himself that he has to do. I mean, phew, boy, I could talk all day about this poem, but that's enough for you to think about, and you fill in the details and see, and again, you see how amazing this is, the incredible symbolism here and the openness, the allegorical quality that you can um, place this poem like a template over your own life and perhaps draw some insights that may assist you. I'd like to conclude with Two Tramps in Mud Time. Uh, one of Frost's poems, it doesn't get a lot of uh, airplay, so to speak, but I think it's terrific. Uh, notice the conflict here uh, between the tramps uh, who are uh, actually uh, woodcutters, uh, loggers of some sort, and the farmer, the rancher, who's, who's uh, cutting his own wood. Out of the mud, two strangers came and caught me splitting wood in the yard, and one of them put me off my aim by hailing cheerily, Hit them hard! I knew pretty well why he dropped behind and let the other go on away. I knew pretty well what he had in mind. He wanted to take my job for pay. Good blocks of oak it was I split, as large around as the chopping block, and every piece I squarely hit fell splinterless as a cloven rock. The blows that a life of self-control spares to strike for the common good that day, giving a loose to my soul, I spent on the unimportant wood. The sun was warm, but the wind was chill. You know how it is with an April day. When the sun is out and the wind is still, you're one month on in the middle of May. But if you so much as dare to speak, a cloud comes over the sunlit arch, a wind comes over a frozen peak, and you're two months back in the middle of March. A bluebird comes tenderly up to a light and turns to the wind to unruffle a plume. His song so pitched as not to excite a single flower is yet to bloom. It is snowing a flake, and he half knew winter was only playing possum. Except in color, he isn't blue, but he wouldn't advise a thing to blossom. The water for which we may have to look in summertime with a witching wand, in every wheel rut's now a brook, in every print of a hoof a pond. Be glad of water, but don't forget the lurking frost in the earth beneath. It will steal forth after the sun is set and show on the water its crystal teeth. The time when most I loved my task, these two must make me love it more by coming with what they came to ask. You'd think I never had felt before the weight of an axe head poised aloft, the grip of earth of outspread feet, the life of muscles rocking soft and smooth and moist in vernal heat. Out of the woods, two hulking tramps. I'm sleeping God knows where last night, but not long since in the lumber camps. They thought all chopping was theirs of right. Men of the woods and lumberjacks, they judged me by their appropriate tool, except as a fellow handled an axe. They had no way of knowing a fool. Nothing on either side was said. They knew they had but to stay their stay, and all their logic would fill my head. As that I had no right to play with what was another man's work for gain. My right might be love, but theirs was need. And where the two exist in twain, theirs was the better right, agreed. But yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. Only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes. Is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes? Wow, isn't that a beautiful, spirited, rollicking poem? I mean, he just goes. And I, and I love how he goes off on these little supposed tangents, talking about the, the wood that he splits and the warm, sunny day and, the, and uh, the sun coming out and the wind still and you're one month back in the middle of March and the cloud coming over and the wind off the frozen peak and the bluebird that comes to to uh, a light uh, beautiful stuff and then and then the diversion into the water and it's all about nature isn't it it's all about the elements outside uh, enjoying breathing he's working he's doing his job he's he's uh, 
chopping the wood. And then along come these lumberjacks, and, you know, they want him to pay them. They're looking for work. They're looking for survival, and you can't blame them. It's 1936. Notice the date it was written. We're talking the Depression here. Just barely coming out of the Depression, just trying to struggle out of the Depression. These guys are out of work, and they're they're trying to uh, get a job. Maybe this is the haves against the have-nots. Here, uh, you know, this is the owner here chopping the wood, and these guys are looking for work. He's not going to hire him. He can chop his own wood. It's interesting, uh, the comment on work, how you really know a person by their work, by what they do. As he says in line 53, they judged me by their appropriate tool, except as a fellow handled an axe. They had no way of knowing a fool. That's how they judge people, and whether they can use an axe or not. But, And he concedes there. He says, well, you know what? Um... I had no right to play with what was another man's work for gain. My right might be love, but theirs was need, and where the two exist in twain, theirs was the better right agreed. He says that, you know, well, they need. I'm just doing it out of love. And then the culmination, the final stanza, where he beautifully, profoundly puts it all into a larger, once again, larger, allegorical, spiritual insight, where he says, My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one in sight. That's a beautiful idea, isn't it? That if you can do what you love to do and make money doing what you love to do, then you've got it. Because only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and future sakes. You've got to find a way in life to make your work valuable, important, and turn your work into your love, not just for money, but for heaven, for your soul, for your self-actualization for your meaning in life. Well, thanks for bearing with me. I love Frost, as you may have noticed, and there's a bunch of other great poems in here. I could read Departmental or The Directive, The Gift Outright, uh, or one of the dramatic poems, uh, Home Burial, or The Death of the Hired Man. Uh, Frost is a wealth of great poetry. Thanks for indulging me, and I'll talk to you next time.